thanks, Jerry, very much. I appreciate it, except for the emeritus stuff. <laughs> Don't rush me, please. <laughs> uh, it's good to be here. I've been here before. I've got, uh, uh, as Jerry was saying, uh, good friends in the audience, but all of you are my friends uh, now as we go through some of the basics and an update on section 1983. If you looked at my outline, you will see that I have three major topics. I'm getting some feedback here. Uh, do you all hear it as well? So can we do something about that? Uh, what, meanwhile, I'll continue talking. Uh, I've got three major topics here. Uh, the first is uh, the elements of the 1983 claim. The second deals with individual immunities, absolute and qualified. And the third uh, deals with local government liability. Uh, I'm going to give about a half hour or so, give or take, to each of these topics. I'll tell you where I am in the outline. I'll occasionally give you sites to related Tenth Circuit uh, cases. Uh, uh, they, you will see in my outline references uh, sometimes to my blog. There are some cases that I'll discuss in passing, but you can find uh, more detailed discussions on my blog and just do a search uh, for the particular case. Well, I'm not covering damages and injunctive relief. I'm not covering procedural defenses such as limitations and preclusion. I'm not covering survival and wrongful death. So let's start uh, with the elements of the Section 1983 claim. And as we all know at this point, Section 1983 uh, was enacted pursuant to Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, and it is designed primarily to enforce uh, the 14th uh, Amendment. Uh, it has a compensatory and regulation of conduct function, obviously, but it also has a deterrence function, a punitive function, if you will, uh, which uh, only applies to individuals. Local governments are not liable for punitive damages under Section 1983, as many of you already know. And even though we're talking about Section 1983, there are obviously other federal civil rights statutes out there. There are very often state uh, civil rights statutes that may be applicable, so we don't want to have blinders out in the real world when we're looking at Section 1983. Uh, Section 1983 covers state and local government violations of the 14th Amendment. I call that constitutional accountability. Since Section 1983 was enacted pursuant to Section 5 of the 14th Amendment, there's a very close relationship uh, between the 14th Amendment and Section 1983. Interestingly enough, even though Section 1983 was enacted in 1871, it was largely dormant until the Supreme Court's decision in 1961, Monroe versus Pape, which gave us three basic principles uh, that uh, some of you know about already, and that is even when a government official acts in violation of state law, that is still action that is under color of law. We interpret Section 1983 against the background of tort liability uh, and make, uh, make people accountable uh, for their constitutional wrongs. Uh, there is no specific intent requirement, and there is no exhaustion of judicial remedies required under Section 1983 uh, either. There is no exhaustion of administrative remedies required under Section 1983, uh, except uh, for purposes of the Civil Rights of Institutionalized Persons Act, amended thereafter by the PLRA, which we're not really going to have a chance to get into middle of page two. The elements uh, of the prima facie case start off with jurisdiction. There is no serious problem with federal court jurisdiction under 1343 and 1331. Some of you may know uh, that uh, section 310 of the Judicial Improvements Act of 1990 expanded pendant parties and pendant claims uh, jurisdiction significantly. Supposedly, when a 1983 lawsuit is filed in federal court, it is filed in a notice pleading jurisdiction. Uh, that has been the case for forever, uh, as a matter of fact, until the Supreme Court handed down the Iqbal case in 2009. Uh, 
9. I'm sure many of you have already encountered it and have tried to use it. The standard is now plausibility. It is not enough for a plaintiff simply to make allegations in conclusory legal terms. Some facts must be pleaded, and even though the Supreme Court said in Iqbal and its predecessor, the Twombly case, that it is not uh, imposing a heightened pleading requirement, we all know that's not the case. There is heightened pleading uh, under Iqbal hereafter, but everybody's struggling with just what that uh, means. There is concurrent jurisdiction in Section 1983 cases in the state courts. Plaintiffs have the option of going first to federal court or going to state court. If they go to state court, of course, uh, defendants can, if they all join together, uh, remove to federal court uh, under 1441. Interestingly enough, if a state's pleading rules are pro-plaintiff and defendants want to m remove to federal court, the defendants will thereafter get the benefit of Iqbal. Uh, of necessity. So that's one strategic consideration among many in defendants deciding to remove to federal uh, court. And I've listed some factors uh, that plaintiffs in fact use in deciding where to go first. Whether you are in state court or federal court, the federal substantive law of section 1983 applies by virtue of the supremacy Clause. So everything I'm going to say today applies regardless of whether you are where you are defending your 1983 lawsuit. Now, going back to this uh, meaningful relationship, so to speak, between Section 1983 and the 14th Amendment, I'm at the top of page three. I'm going to give you, uh, uh, I'm going to indecently expose you, if you will, to some constitutional law before we move on. <clears throat> Clearly, the 14th Amendment has a due process and an equal protection clause standing alone. More about those later. Uh, with respect to the equal protection clause, most of us learned in law school about suspect classifications, the typical use of equal protection when the plaintiff is a member of a class uh, which has been discriminated against. You probably may know, but if you don't, you're going to learn this for the first time. The Supreme Court told us in the Village of Willowbrook case that there is such a thing as a class of one equal protection case where a defendant uh, allegedly treats a plaintiff uh, in a manner that is very different from the way others similarly situated are treated, and there is no rational basis for so doing, it's arbitrary and capricious, there may very well be a class of one equal protection claim. A village of Willowbrook was a zoning case, interesting question. Could a public employee sue a public employer alleging a class of one equal protection claim? And the Supreme Court held in the Enquist case, which I've given you here, uh, that no, there is no such thing as a class of one equal protection claim that can be brought by a public employee in connection with uh, claimed arbitrary capricious treatment regarding uh, employment. So that's. Uh, something that you want to be aware of, class of one, yes, public employment, uh, not applicable uh, at all. Uh, there is also uh, a line of cases dealing with rights of access. The leading case there is the Harbury case that I've given you here, and that is a case which deals with both backward-looking right of access cases where claims, for example, of cover-ups uh, are made and that prevented the plaintiff from filing a lawsuit in a timely fashion or forward-looking right of access claims and those typically arise in the prison setting. I have, and this is one of those uh, 10 circuit cases that I will sprinkle my presentation with occasionally, there is a right of access case that the 10th circuit uh, handed down. It's a backward looking right of access case. The site is, uh, it's Lynch, L-Y-N-C-H, the Lynch case. 
2013 Westlaw 49713. 2013 Westlaw 49713, it's Lynch versus Barrett. So you want to make a note of that. Well, that's a quick look at some of, uh, you know, equal protection and due process, if you will, which is what right of access is based on. But we all know that the 14th Amendment incorporates uh, most of the provisions of the Bill of Rights. And clearly the First Amendment uh, is among those. Um, those of you with experience remember the pre-Garcetti days, uh, the days uh, with respect to public employee free speech issues, uh, which is when Pickering, I call it the Pickering two-step, governed, uh, it's a dance, it governed in public employee free speech cases. Uh, in those cases when a public employee at that time under Pickering, if a public employee was disciplined, uh, because of what he or she said, the question became, is the First Amendment relevant? And that depended upon whether the speech of the public employee was on an issue of public concern or not. If it was on an issue of public concern, then you next went into the second step, and that is you balanced the interest of the government against the uh, free speech interest of the individual. Usually the employee won, but not always. We now have a dramatic change, a dramatic change in public employee free speech doctrine with Garcetti because there is a threshold consideration. There is now what I call this Garcetti three-step. The first question is, regardless of whether the speech is a matter of public concern or private concern, even if it's a matter of public concern, whistleblowing, for example, even if, a, if an employee reports to his or her superiors about whistleblowing, clearly an issue of public concern, if it turns out that that speech is part of the employee's duties, job description, if you will, then the First Amendment becomes inapplicable to employer discipline. That is a sea change, and many of you have probably already litigated cases dealing with the question of whether you are in a Garcetti world or you somehow passed the threshold inquiry into employee duties and job description and are now in a public concern world. Major sea change. I can't uh, overstate that. Uh, another First Amendment case that you'll want to know about is the uh, Durier case, Borough of Durier, the Garnieri uh, case. I always think of chamber music when I hear that uh, uh, case name. Uh, but the Supreme Court in that case dealt with an interesting question. Remember I just mentioned Pickering. Can a public employee get around the public concern requirement of Pickering, forget Garcetti, of Pickering by bringing a claim uh, under the petition clause, petition for redress of grievances, even if the grievance is primarily a matter of private concern, an end run around Pickering. Supreme Court uh, in the uh, borough of Duryea case said, no, you can't do that when a public employee brings a petition clause claim arising out of public employment concerns, then uh, the public concern requirement is applicable as well. Here's an interesting uh, issue that I want to let you know about, and uh, it's not in my outline, I'm going to give it to you anyway. Uh, uh, two sites. The first one is a Supreme Court site, and it's going to go my outline next. Uh, 126 Supreme Court, 1695. 126 Supreme Court, 1695. As you can tell from the site, it's a nine, uh, 2006 decision. Here's what the court held there, and then I'm going to get to the point. The Supreme Court held that uh, when a person sues a law enforcement officer, alleging that that law enforcement officer was responsible for initiating a prosecution against that plaintiff, in violation of that plaintiff's free speech rights, 
The Supreme Court held in Hartman versus Moore, for various reasons we don't have time to get into now, um, mostly causation, that that plaintiff has to allege and prove not only that there was an impermissible retaliatory motive on the part of the law enforcement officer, but that there was no probable cause for the prosecution. That there was no probable cause for the prosecution. That's Hartman versus Moore. Notice that's a retaliatory prosecution case. Fascinating issue that has split the circuits, and I'll tell you what the Tenth Circuit did. Fascinating issue that split the circuits. What about retaliatory arrests? What if a plaintiff alleges that a police officer arrested him or her for an impermissible reason because of what he or she said? Does the probable cause requirement apply there? In other words, would the presence of probable cause serve as a defense or not? As I understand the Tenth Circuit uh, position on this matter, the answer is probable cause is irrelevant to a First Amendment retaliatory arrest case. You all probably know where I'm going now. There was a case involving Secret Service agents protecting Vice President Cheney some years back, uh, and the Tenth Circuit held that uh, the plaintiff uh, alleged a First Amendment retaliatory arrest claim uh, against the Secret Service uh, agents, and moreover that the defendants were not protected by qualified immunity because it was clearly settled on the Tenth Circuit that probable cause was irrelevant. Supreme Court in this next site that I'm going to give you, Reichel versus Howards, R-E-I-C-H-L-E versus Howards, 112 Supreme Court 2088, a 2012 decision. Reichel versus Howard's 112 Supreme Court 2088, um, 2012. The Supreme Court held that uh, didn't reach a decision on the merits with respect to whether probable cause was a defense to a retaliatory arrest claim, but it said it's, uh, it. Tenth Circuit got it wrong on qualified immunity. It was not clearly settled. One reason it wasn't clearly settled is because we, the Supremes, have never ruled on the issue. The other, the other justification was more interesting, but wait a minute, the Tenth Circuit said it was clearly settled in the Tenth Circuit. Here's what the Supreme Court said, mind-boggling. Tenth Circuit, you read your own precedents wrong. Yes. You read your own precedents wrong. Go back and ask Justice Thomas. He wrote the opinion, uh, which is a very interesting phenomenon. You don't see that sort of thing very often because, as I'll explain later, later uh, if there's no Supreme Court decision, circuit decisions establish clearly settled law for qualified uh, immunity uh, purposes. <laughs> All right, so let's now uh, move on uh, there's a hot issue pending in the Supreme Court, this Plumhoff versus Rickard case out of the Sixth Circuit. Scott versus Harris, I, I'm sure some of you have had high-speed police chases implicating the Fourth Amendment. I, I say that with some emphasis because the Fourth Amendment gets implicated when you have a seizure. So usually these cases are intentional ramming cases. A high-speed police case in which somebody is injured without the intentional conduct gives rise, as you know, to a possible substantive due process uh, claim. But that's not what we're talking about now. Well, in Scott v. Harris, the Supreme Court some years ago said two very interesting things. It said, first of all, that even when deadly force is used, you don't necessarily have to give a special deadly force instruction. It's the Graham versus Connor excessive force uh, instruction that is used in those cases. Secondly, the Supreme Court actually overturned uh, lower court's decisions on the basis of a video of the entire chase. And Justice Stevens was, if I remember correctly, the only dissenter there. He said, wait a minute, you've usurped the function of a jury. There are jury genuine issues of material fact in dispute. Well, uh, the long and short of it is, and you take a look at Plumhoff, is uh, the claim in Plumhoff from the by the petitioners was that the Sixth Circuit uh, uh, misunderstood 
Scott v. Harris, both in connection with the approach to deadly force used there and because there was a video of the entire chase and the Sixth Circuit did not give sufficient attention to the video in terms of making its decision in favor of the uh, plaintiff. All right, so, uh, and you can check that one out at some depth in my, uh, in my blog. It's not only incorporated provisions of the Bill of Rights uh, that I've talked about that are governed by Section 1983. You've also got Dormant Commerce Clause. Remember that good stuff from law school? I still teach constitutional law. Remember Dormant Commerce Clause? Uh, you probably repressed it. Anyway, in certain circumstances, Dormant Commerce Clause claims are actionable under 1983. What's that mean as a practical matter? That means 1983 can sometimes be used, is sometimes used, by businesses seeking damages and or injunctive relief and uh, a attorney's fees. Here is a hot topic, uh, probably none, none hotter. The Second Amendment, <laughs> all right? Well, this Heller case held that there is indeed a Second Amendment right, an individual Second Amendment right to have firearms in the home for self-defense. That's the holding of Heller, five to four. Heller was thereafter determined by the Supreme Court in the McDonald case, arising out of my hometown, Chicago, the Seventh Circuit, uh, to apply to state and local governments as well. So 1983 actions can be brought in theory to uh, collect damages for violations of the Second Amendment. There are lots of issues percolating through the circuits, and you all know that because one of those uh, cases uh, is a Tenth Circuit case. What happens, for example, uh, to extending Heller beyond the home to include concealed carry, open carry? What about registration? What about training? Well, all we know thus far from the circuits, which have gone off on different, in different directions on some of these issues, is that intermediate level scrutiny seems to be the applicable standard where the Second Amendment is found uh, applicable. Uh, you know that your 10 circuit uh, held in the Peterson versus Martinez case, I'll give you the site, 21, uh, 2013 West Law, 646413, 2013 Westlaw 646413, a 2013 decision that the, uh, carrying concealed weapons outside the home is not protected by the Second, by, by the second Amendment. In contrast, the Seventh Circuit in Moore versus Madigan went the other way. Are these things going to get to the Supreme Court? Obviously. In our lifetimes? Obviously. Let us hope. So, those are some of the incorporated provisions of the Bill of Rights. Let us now uh, move quickly into some of the other elements, the non-constitutional elements. Well, to some extent, what I'm going to say now is constitutional. State action and color of law. You need state action uh, in order to have a 14th Amendment uh, violation. When you have state action, you've automatically got color of law. I'll tell you uh, what the easy state action cases are where public employees operate pursuant to law and allegedly infringe a person's constitutional rights. Somewhat harder, but still state action, a public employee violates state law, but still uh, allegedly violates uh, a plaintiff's constitutional rights. And those are easy state action cases. The hardest state action cases of all are where Private individuals, private entities are sued under Section 1983 for violating a plaintiff's constitutional rights. The question is, do we treat the private uh, person's conduct or the private entity's conduct as if it is state action? It's an attribution question. Let me be fancy about that. When can we attribute the nominally private conduct of the individual or the entity 
to the state or local government. And there are three major tests uh, here, which we don't have a chance to get into, public function. Uh, sometimes a private entity serves a public function. Prisons, for example, serve a traditional and exclusive governmental function. Schools, you would think they would be, but private schools are not considered to be state actors because private schools do not perform a traditional and exclusively governmental function. Symbiotic relationship, they don't arise very often in these cases where you can't tell the difference between the private entity and the government, you know, a close symbiotic relationship. Here is probably the most trenchant test. It's the nexus test. Look at the nominally private conduct and ask that attribution question that I told you about. Did the government f cause, did the government direct that that private conduct occur? Then you've got state action. Did the government encourage that private conduct? Then you may have state action. Did the government just allow the private conduct? Then you don't have state action. It's a question of uh, the strength of the nexus between the government and the nominally private uh, conduct. I've given you a bunch of cases at the bottom of page three and at the very top of page four. One easy way for plaintiffs, at least it was easy before Iqbal, query whether it's much harder now, is to allege a conspiracy between a private person or entity and a government official. But the conspiracy, the Supreme Court held that you got an allegation of state action against the private entity as well. But conspiracy, I think after Iqbal, you better have a little, the plaintiff better have a little bit more going for himself or herself than just a bare allegation of a uh, conspiracy. State of mind requirements, page four. Uh, I will tell you very simply that section 1983 does not have its own state of mind requirements as a matter of statute. What does have state of mind requirements? the particular constitutional provisions. Many of you know this already, but for those of you who are relatively new to this area, uh, equal protection requires purposeful discrimination. No such thing as a negligent or even grossly negligent equal protection violation. The Eighth Amendment requires at least deliberate indifference. No such thing as a negligent Eighth Amendment violation. Uh, due process requires at least deliberate indifference. No such thing as a negligent uh, uh, due process violation. These are all constitutional states of mind and notice what they do. The higher the state of mind, the more difficult it is for plaintiffs to overcome. So that, for example, in cases involving high-speed police uh, chases, which don't involve intentional ramming and therefore you're not in the Fourth Amendment world, what the Supreme Court say is a state of mind required? It's the purpose to do harm, constant shocking, i.e. the purpose to do harm. Now how often is a plaintiff going to be able to prove that a police officer had the purpose to do harm in one of these high-speed police chases that ends tragically? The answer, seldom indeed. So it serves a kind of gatekeeper uh, function, so you need to be sensitive to that. For those of you who are relatively new, and maybe for those of you who have been around for a while, this is another very important point, causation in fact. How many of you know what the Mount Healthy burden shift is? I'm just curious. Ah, so this may be valuable, unless everybody's very shy. You all know it. You might be shy because most of you are backbenching. You know, in my class, I walk over to the backbenchers and I ask them questions, but I wouldn't dare do that to you. Uh, we're, we're friends and I want to remain that way. Here's the Mount Healthy burden shift. Suppose, and it's really important, suppose a plaintiff alleges that a uh, public employer fired him or her for racially discriminatory reasons. Okay? And suppose the plaintiff actually is able to show that yes, race played a role in the discharge or the refusal to hire. It doesn't matter for our purposes. 
It turns out that that plaintiff, even after showing that, may still be a, unable to recover any damages. Why? Because of the Mount Healthy, I've given you the site, burden shift. The public employer can say, well, wait a minute. Even if that was, in fact, an impermissible, uh, even if, in fact, impermissible motivation was a factor in our decision about you, this, we had another reason for firing you. You were incompetent. You were subordinate, insubordinate. You were late. A permissible reason for firing you. If, here's the burden shift now, if the employer could prove by a preponderance of the evidence that the employee would have been discharged anyway, I'll say that again, if the employer could prove by a preponderance of the evidence that the employee would have been discharged anyway, that employer walks. There is no liability whatever. That's the Mount Healthy burden shift. Now, some of you may be thinking, wait a minute, what if I, my client is sued for, say, racial discrimination, it can be a sex discrimination case, it can be a First Amendment case, my, uh, my, my uh, governmental body, my defendant is sued uh, in the same circumstances and doesn't look too good, but then we do discovery and find out that this employee lied on his or her application. Does Mount Healthy kick in there? Answer, I'm sorry it doesn't because it's not a mixed motive case. The motives have to be relevant to the decision to fire. However, you're not, you're not lost altogether because from and after the time you discover that that plaintiff, that employee was not entitled to the job in the first place, that plaintiff is not entitled to damages. Okay? So that's the McKinnon case that I've given you here uh, in the outline after acquired evidence, the middle of page uh, four. Proximate cause, uh, another subject that many of us have repressed from law school. Remember that Paul's graph and wagon mound and all that good stuff? Well, I was a torch teacher. I actually loved teaching it in inverse proportion to the way my students reacted uh, to, to it. Uh, so proximate cause, the general test is reasonable foreseeability. But let me give you a 10 circuit case that does some very interesting things with it. Uh, take the site down. It's Martinez versus Carson. 697 Fed 3rd, 1252. 697 Fed 3rd, 1252. It's a 10th Circuit 2012 uh, case, which actually held state corrections officers liable under the Fourth Amendment for allegedly unconstitutional conduct that city law enforcement officers thereafter engaged in when the plaintiff was transferred from the state to the city. Yeah. The jury could find that the defendants knew or should have known that their illegal seizure and transfer of custody would result in plaintiff's prolonged detention, even if they could not have foreseen the full extent of that detention, that the, what the defendants did could reasonably uh, have been foreseen, or what the city law enforcement folks did could reasonably have been uh, foreseen by the defendants. Very interesting proximate cause case. I'm going to skip over the bottom of page four with laws actions. I'll ask my usual question and probably get the usual answer. Has anybody here ever had a 1983 laws action? Anybody here currently? All right, what you need to know is that in, in, a, in certain circumstances, bottom of page four, top of page five, in certain circumstances, Federal statutory violations can be actionable under Section 1983 because Section 1983 refers to rights, privileges, and immunities secured by the Constitution and laws. I've given you the cases in which the Supreme Court very uh, narrowly circumscribed the scope of Section 1983 laws actions. I want to uh, talk very briefly uh, about a very different issue. Uh, the issue of, I call it here, preemption uh, at item three, but it's really better termed preclusion. Is it possible that 
uh, when Congress enacts certain federal statutes protecting individual rights, that that could evince a congressional intent to preclude the use of Section 1983 for the same claims. Example, Title IX prohibits sexual sex discrimination uh, on the part of universities and other entities which take federal funds in connection with the um, athletic activities and the like. Make that assumption with me. In the operation, schools, the same sort of thing. Interesting question. Does that mean, mean, does that mean when a student uh, wants to use Section 1983 to allege peer-on-peer -peer sexual harassment in a public school, that Title IX has effectively precluded that use of Section 1983 and only Title IX can be used? Interesting question. Supreme Court held in the Barnstable case that no Title IX and Section 1983 are so very different in scope that Congress could not have intended that Title IX preclude the use of Section 1983 for such sex discrimination claims. What was before the court a few months ago uh, in Madigan versus uh, Levin was a parallel question. The Seventh Circuit alone recently ruled in this case that the fact that the, AD, uh, the ADEA, Americans uh, Discrimination and Employment Act, the ADEA uh, prohibits age discrimination, age discrimination in employment, does not preclude the use by plaintiffs in 1983 cases of equal protection to allege age discrimination. The Seventh Circuit is the only circuit that has so held. So the Supreme Court granted cert and found out that the plaintiff in this case was not even covered by the ADEA and dismissed the case as improvidently granted. Very embarrassing for both sides as the court began to grill. You can listen. Anybody, any of you know about OEA.org? Do you know you can get, I mean, our law school runs it. All of the oral arguments of the Supreme Court are available from 1955 on. All of them, including stuff that's done on a week-to-week -week basis. Mind-blowing, an incredible tool for those of you who are interested in oral advocacy and certainly in the law school setting. All right, so the Seventh Circuit is an outlier in this regard. We have to say a few words about Heck v. Humphrey, move quickly into substantive due process, and then get into immunities. <coughs> Here is the Heck v. Humphrey scenario, incredibly technical stuff. If you're involved in litigation where a plaintiff has a, an existing conviction, Heck v. Humphrey may be applicable. And I'm going to give you two hypos. <laughs> The plaintiff is convicted of a crime. I don't care what the crime is. The plaintiff sues law enforcement officers alleging that they manufactured the evidence to prosecute and convict him. Question, can that plaintiff proceed in federal court even though he has been convicted and remains convicted of the particular crime. Supreme Court's answer in Heck v. Humphrey, no. Why? Because if the plaintiff's lawsuit is successful, remember the claim, the defendants manufactured evidence to prosecute and convict him, if that plaintiff's claim is successful, that would undermine the validity of the conviction. And Habeas corpus principles tell us, this is all informed by habeas, that the plaintiff is going to have to proceed through habeas and get the conviction overturned before the 1983 cause of action accrues. Ultimately, it's about when the 1983 claim for damages accrues. Now, I'll give you another hypothetical to make the point, I hope, even clearer. 
because it's a messy, complicated area. Maybe more trouble than it's been worth, I'm not sure, for everybody. The plaintiff has been convicted of a crime. Oh, it can be arson, it can be burglary, I don't care what it is. And now the plaintiff alleges that the police officers used excessive force in arresting him. When does that Fourth Amendment excessive force claim accrue? Well, if it's successful, does that undermine the validity of the conviction for burglary or arson? No. That cause of action accrues when causes of action normally accrue, when all the elements of the cause of action are present. Uh, you need to know something about Heck v. Humphrey uh, if you're dealing with uh, a case in which, as I said, the plaintiff uh, is convicted and the conviction is still standing. And I'm going to give you a couple of Tenth Circuit cases that talk about uh, Heck v. Humphrey in, uh, in the 1983 setting. Here is the first of them. It's Klen versus City of Loveland. Anybody's Loveland, City of Loveland here in New Mexico? Klen, K-L-E-N, 661 Fed 3rd 498. 661 Fed 3rd 498, that's one finding that heck did not apply there. And McCarty versus Gilchrist, M-C-C-A-R-T-Y, 646 Fed 3rd 1281. 646 Fed 3rd 1281, another Tenth Circuit opinion. Both of these, by the way, were handed down in 20. Uh, 11. So you'll want to read uh, those. One very important point, bottom of page three, as we move very quickly uh, through the first part, uh, and that is that we're only talking about an existing conviction when the plaintiff files his or her lawsuit. If the conviction, if, if a criminal prosecution is anticipated, if a conviction is anticipated, it doesn't matter. The court may stay the 1983 claim in order to wait to see what happens. But Heck v. Humphrey technically is not applicable in that uh, setting. Let's now move quickly uh, into uh, substantive due process. And what I'm going to do there uh, is simply uh, set out the general rule and give you a couple of 10th Circuit cases on what is always a troublesome area. Substantive due process, affirmative duties. Here we're talking constitutional law again. Uh, many of you probably know about the DeShaney decision from decades ago where the Supreme Court held that the Constitution is a charter of negative liberties, that there is no due process affirmative duty on the part of government to protect any one of us from private harm. A cop two blocks away can see you being murdered no affirmative due process duty to intervene to save you. Now, there may be state law issues, but we're talking constitutional uh, law. There are exceptions to uh, this. Uh, one exception is where there is a special relationship. Foster children, for example, uh, are in a special relationship with the state. School children are not. Uh, and danger creation, where the state actually affirmatively places the plaintiff in a position of danger. There was a Seventh Circuit case decades ago where police stopped a woman on a very busy highway. She had a couple of kids, little kids in the back of the car, White versus Rochford. I tell this story all the time, forgive me. And the police arrest the woman, take her to the station, leave these little kids in the car. And the car is hit, and the kids are seriously injured. Well, look, the police in that situation created the danger to the children. So that was an end run around the Cheney affirmative duty rule. Here are two uh, very interesting uh, uh, cases. 
each going the other way. The first 10th Circuit affirmative duty case is the estate of BIC versus Gillen. Estate of BIC v. Gillen, 2012 uh, Westlaw, 660 4485. 2012 Westlaw, 6604485, a 10th Circuit 2012 case. And this is where uh, the Shaney uh, was and run. The Shaney was applied in the Gray case, applied against the plaintiff in Gray versus University of Colorado, 672 Fed 3rd 909, 672 Fed 3rd 909. So you want to pay attention uh, to that and what the 10th Circuit has said. What can I say about Section 1983 malicious prosecution that hasn't already been said? It's a messy area indeed. Here's what we know. That there is no such thing as a Section 1983 substantive due process malicious prosecution cause of action. No such thing. But apart from that, most of the circuits, including the 10th, do allow for Section 1983 malicious prosecution claims that could be brought under the Fourth Amendment, uh, most typically, perhaps sometimes under procedural due process, maybe sometimes even under uh, uh, the First uh, Amendment. Uh, the Tenth Circuit appears to require the absence of probable cause for a 1983 malicious prosecution claim, even if it's not a Fourth Amendment 1983 malicious prosecution claim. And here's the, the case. I, I think I gave you this site before in another setting. It's McCarty versus Gilchrist. McCarty, M-C-C-A-R-T-Y, 646 Fed 3rd, 1281. 646 Fed 3rd, 1281. And about the plaintiff who has spent almost 19 years on death row. Murder charges were eventually uh, dismissed. The plaintiff lost here because there was probable cause uh, to support a reasonable belief in the plaintiff's guilt. All right. I want to say a few things about immunities. <clears throat> and divide the immunities into two kinds. Absolute immunity and qualified immunity. Absolute immunity is what it suggests. A defendant who is absolutely immune gets out from under, usually uh, with a motion for summary judgment, occasionally with a motion to dismiss or a motion for judgment on the pleadings. There are three major points I want you to know and remember about immunities in general. For the most part, the functions that get immunity, the people who are protected, that's historically based. The court looks to the history. The second major takeaway point I want you to get is that Immunities, whether they are absolute or qualified, are not intended to protect individuals. They're intended to protect certain functions, otherwise known as the functional approach. That means that there are times when a defendant who would ordinarily be absolutely immune, a legislator, a judge, a prosecutor, loses absolute immunity because the functions challenge the case are protected only by qualified immunity. Conversely, and this often arises in situations involving administrative agencies, conversely, there are some government officials who are ordinarily protected by qualified immunity who might be kicked up to absolute immunity because they're performing quasi-judicial functions. So that is uh, the second important point I want you to take away. And the third point is the most general of them all. Whether you're talking about absolute immunity or qualified immunity, the concern in these cases is with protecting individual, independent governmental decision making. Your concern is with protecting independent decision making by government officials. 
If you want to put it a little more fancily, the concern in these cases is with not over deterring government officials. Okay? We want to strike the right balance between compensation for constitutional deprivations and uh, deterrence. <laughs> Three privileged characters protected ordinarily by absolute immunity. The first, state and local legislators. There's Tenney and there's Bogan v. Scott Harris. I'm in page nine. There's Lake Country Estates. As Justice Frankfurt has said ages ago in Tenney v. Brandhove in 1951, we must not expect uncommon courage in legislators. <laughs> Look, as I tell my students, Next to being a plaintiff in a lawsuit, the worst thing is being a defendant in a lawsuit. Right? You know, if you can stay out of court as a, as a normal person, you stay out of court. We all know that as, as lawyers. Well, uh, what does absolute immunity mean with respect to state and local legislators, judges and prosecutors about whom I'll talk in a few moments? It means that not only are we concerned when we apply absolute immunity with protecting these folks from liability, we are concerned as well with letting them that get out from under being sued as quickly as possible. In other words, we are concerned with minimizing not just the costs of liability, but the costs of defending. That's what absolute immunity is all about. Minimizing the cost of defending, making sure these folks get out from under having to defend as quickly as uh, possible. So the functional approach, state and local legislators are protected by absolute immunity only with respect to their legislative functions legislating, holding legislative hearings and the like, but not with respect to administrative acts, hiring and firing people. Judges are absolutely immune from damages liability for their judicial conduct. Even if, let's say, a judge knowingly applies an unconstitutional statute to convict uh, the the. 1983 plaintiff to be. That's Pearson versus Ray. Notice what we do when we say absolute immunity. We don't care if the allegations are true. They can be true. We're still letting the defendants, these absolutely immune defendants, get out from under section, the section 1983 uh, litigation. Judicial immunity is incredibly broad. Surprise, surprise, who decides the scope of judicial immunity. <laughs> okay. uh, it is so broad, I, I always have to tell the story about Morelos versus Waco, where a judge uh, was ticked off by a lawyer who was late for a court appearance. They didn't have a very good relationship, obviously, to begin with. So the judge tells his bailiff, get so-and-so to me. He was in another courtroom. Get him to me and do whatever you need to do. <laughs> Well, the bailiff took this literally and allegedly used excessive force against the lawyer. Again, that relationship was done for anyway. So the lawyer sued the judge for damages under Section 1983. Pretty clearly could sue, successfully sue the bailiff. But what about the judge? Supreme Court said, well, wait a minute. The question of whether we have a judicial act is twofold. First, is this a function normally performed by a judge? Well, judges normally ask bailiffs to get lawyers and litigants before them. And secondly, did the judge act pursuant to the expectations of the parties? Sure. Ah, this is, you know, there was no problem with that, so there was a judicial act. How about jurisdiction? Well, there was pretty clearly jurisdiction. There was a case that was there and this, if you will, personal jurisdiction as well. So what I like to say about Morales versus Waco is that a judge will only lose judicial immunity if he or she gets off the bench and starts duking it out with a lawyer. 
And then judicial immunity may depend upon whether the judge is wearing his or her robe while they're fighting. <laughs> I'm being facetious. I'm overstating it. But that's uh, pretty... Uh, judicial immunity goes pretty far uh, indeed. <laughs> Prosecutorial immunity is uh, a very uh, complicated subject, and that's because while the general rule is that prosecutors are absolutely immune for their advocative conduct, even if they're accused of suborning perjury in the course of a criminal trial, even if they are accused of initiating a prosecution against the 1983 plaintiff for vindictive, malicious reasons, absolute immunity applies there. That's relatively straightforward. Stump the Sparkman tells us all of that. But prosecutors do so much more than just litigate criminal cases or relevant civil cases as well. So what you've got here is the need in prosecutorial immunity cases to make a major distinction. This is a fundamental distinction. Is the prosecutor, is the challenged conduct advocative in nature or is it investigative? If it's advocative in nature, absolute immunity. Is it investigative? It's qualified immunity because investigation is what police officers do and police officers are protected by qualified immunity. What a mess. I'll tell you why it's a mess among other things, among other reasons. It's a mess because very often uh, you have all confronted, uh, had to defend 1983 cases in which the plaintiff throws out, I'm going to exaggerate, 10, 15, 20 claims of unconstitutional conduct against a prosecutor. Guess what? You, somebody's got to do the analysis for each and every one of those allegations, for each and every one of those acts. And you have to ask, is it advocative or is it investigative? For each and every act, you always focus in these immunity cases on the challenge conduct. And this can be a real mess. So that, let me run quickly through some of these uh, cases. Giving legal advice to police officers, qualified immunity only. A claim that a prosecutor manufactured evidence in order to create probable cause. Notice the investigative tinge there? To create probable cause for to prosecute later. That's only protected by qualified immunity. Uh, that's Buckley versus Fitzsimmons. A prosecutor who sued in connection with holding a press conference that somehow violates the plaintiff's constitutional rights. That's protected only by qualified immunity. A prosecutor who allegedly makes false statements in obtaining an arrest warrant. That is, that's Kalina, that is, or Kalina, that is uh, qualified immunity uh, only. Uh, notice these are considered to be investigative functions, if you will, or at least not advocative functions. Here is an exception that the Supreme Court carved out for supervisors in prosecutors' offices. <laughs> That's Van de Camp. <laughs> Suppose a prosecutor is sued for uh, failing to properly train his or her subordinates in connection with, uh, well, okay, it can be the use of informants, the proper use of informants, it can be Brady violations, I don't care what it is. Now. In the course of the litigation, in the criminal proceeding itself, the prosecutors, the subordinates, you know, they are absolutely immune in connection with what goes on at the trial. Absolutely immune. So they're going to get off the hook. But wait a minute. Failing to train is not advocative in nature. What do the, so under the functional approach, supervisory, uh, prosecutors should be 
qualifiedly in the Supreme Court held, interesting, only on the basis of policy, and it admitted that it was not following its typical functional approach. It said absolute immunity there as well. Policy, how can it be that we let the subordinates off the hook by, through absolute immunity, but we don't let the supervisor off the hook for the same kind of conduct, which is trial related. I have to emphasize the limitations in that case. We're not talking about record keeping. We're not talking about hiring and firing. We're not talking about those kinds of supervisory decisions, we, which would still probably be protected only by qualified immunity, but only about decisions involving trials themselves or that lead to what subordinates do uh, at these uh, trials. All right, qualified immunity. I am now at page 11. Uh, I talked to enough federal judges to know that as aggravating as qualified immunity is to all of you, it is even more aggravating for them. And it's aggravating to them both at the district court level and at the court of appeals level. They don't like this. As we'll see what the Supreme Court has done, and here's a general observation to take with you, while qualified immunity was originally much narrower than absolute immunity, because qualified immunity was designed to minimize the costs of liability, what the Supreme Court has done is gradually move qualified immunity in the direction of absolute immunity and make it much more defendant protective with respect to minimizing the costs of defense. We'll talk about that in just a moment, the Harlow Objective Qualified Immunity Test, you know, about interlocutory appeals. These are all uh, factors that support my observation. Well, what is the Qualified Immunity Test? <laughs> I will set it out and then I'll unpack it, to use a, a, a modest uh, uh, term. We ask of the defendant's conduct as follows. Could the defendant reasonably have believed at the time of his or her conduct and in light of then existing law that the conduct was constitutional. If the defendant, in light of then existing law, could have believed that the conduct was constitutional, then that defendant escapes liability. Even if it turns out that the conduct is unconstitutional. Let me be specific for those of you who are relatively new to this area, because it can get messy. Today is what? December the? 6th. December the 6th. All right, December the 6th, 2013. Let's assume a, a, a lawsuit uh, filed today, and it's be, uh, alleging a particular constitutional violation. I don't care what it is. It deals with conduct that occurred on December 6, 2010. Okay, give that to me. The question, was there a constitutional violation? We decide that question as of December 6, 2013. We decide that right now. What is the law now? As to the question of whether the defendant at the time violated clearly set a law, in other words, acted with a reasonable belief that the conduct was constitutional, we ask that question as of December the 6th, 2010. We are engaged in time travel, folks, in the qualified immunity setting. We're going back and forth going back and forth, which means that litigants and judges have to decide the, may have to decide the constitutional merits, 
both now and what was going on three years ago. If it was clearly settled three years ago that what the defendant did violated the law, the defendant loses unqualified immunity. If it was not clearly settled, then the defendant could reasonably have believed, in light of then existing law, that the conduct was constitutional. <laughs> you get that? You, you, these two temporal inquiries, you always decide the constitutional merits now, using current law. We always decide qualified immunity uh, looking to the past. <laughs> now, at the bottom of page 11, <laughs> and top of page 12, I go through some basics. First of all, what do we mean by clearly settled law? Do, what does, a, what does a, a defendant want to say is clearly settled law? Your Honor, we need a case on all fours. If there's no case on all fours, then of course our client did not violate clearly settled law as of December 6, 2010. The plaintiff says, wait a minute, we don't need a case on all fours. All we need is a general principle. The general principles of, say, the Fourth Amendment or the First Amendment were established on December 6, 2010. And therefore, the defendant violated clearly said a law. Well, what's the, what has the court done? The court has come down a little closer to defendants than it has to plaintiffs. What you need is case law as of December 6, 2010, that gave, that could have given the defendant fair notice that the conduct was unconstitutional. If the precedents as of December 6, 2010 did not give the defendant fair notice that the conduct was unconstitutional, then the defendant walks. Anderson v. Creighton says you need to have some precedents, you need to have some parallel to, uh, in your fact pattern, to what facts were in existing precedent. Do you need a case on all fours? Do you need a case at all? Answer, you don't need a case. A police officer, here's an outrageous example, a police officer walks up to a citizen and just shoots him for no reason whatever. As some court or another said, you don't need a case at all to demonstrate that that violates clearly settled Fourth Amendment law. Eighth Amendment, you treat a, uh, a prisoner outrageously uh, in terms of inflicting punishment, no food, no water uh, attached uh, to a stake in a prison yard for days. You don't need an Eighth Amendment case to demonstrate that that violates clearly settled law. I've given you uh, some cases. It was only a whole day. I don't want to engage in hyperbole, Steve. Thanks for, uh, <laughs> thanks for correcting me. But that was still an easy case. Would you agree? Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I've given you some cases involving uh, the Fourth Amendment, bottom of page eight, uh, Messerschmitt, allegedly overbroad search warrant, Ryburn versus Hoff, dealing with summary reversal uh, in a warrantless entry into the home case. And I, I have to give you, I have to give you uh, a Tenth Circuit uh, case also dealing with a warrantless entry. Uh, and that case is, let me get you the site here, it's Mascoro versus Billings. Mascoro, M-A-S-C-O-R-R-O, 656 Fed 3rd, 1198, 656 Fed 3rd, 1198, a 2011 10th Circuit case, in which case uh, this, the 10th Circuit held that the uh, defendants were not protected by qualified immunity. This gives you uh, the sense of this. Uh, no reasonable officer would have thought pursuit of a minor for a mere misdemeanor traffic offense constituted the sort of exigency permitting entry into a home without a warrant. So you want to take a look at that. All right, so you have some general sense now of what clearly settled law is. Whose decisions uh, 
determine clearly settled law. Well, remember I was talking about the Reichel versus Howard's case? Well, look, you start at the top. Is there a Supreme Court decision as of December the 6th, 2010, that provides some guidance on this issue? If the answer is no, there is none, then you look to your own circuit. Is there a 10th Circuit decision that provides some guidance on this constitutional question? If the answer to that is no, then you might look at whether there is a consensus, a prevailing consensus, in the other circuits on that kind of issue. So even if the 10th Circuit has been silent, the other circuits have pretty much all agreed. If there is no consensus and no 10th Circuit uh, case law that is relevant, uh, can you look to district court opinions? Well, it's very clear that district court opinions do not establish, make clearly settled law. They don't do it. They are evidence of clearly settled law, but they themselves don't do it. And while we're at this, let me add one other court that we want to look at here in New Mexico. You want to look at the New Mexico Supreme Court to see whether it has taken a position on your particular federal constitutional issue. Remember 1983 and 14th Amendment, not state constitutional kinds of issues. So uh, those are the courts uh, that establish clearly settled law. And if you don't have any judicial decisions of any real relevance, then the defendant walks. The defendant is protected by qualified uh, immunity. A couple of more things. Um, I'm hoping I can go till 10 after because we began 10 minutes. Is that no problem? Thank you. I got permission from the boss. Um, in real world terms, this is how qualified immunity often plays out. I'm talking about the order of battle. A federal district court confronted with a qualified immunity summary judgment motion and therefore having to engage in the task of determining whether it's clearly settled law will look at the merits of the case and say, oh my Lord, it's going to take me forever to do the research. It's going to take forever for my clerk to do the research and for me to think about whether there's a constitutional violation here. But I'm going back to December 6, 2010. I know that the law was not clearly settled then. I'm going to duck the merits and I'm going to rule in favor of the defendant on qualified immunity grounds. Here's the problem with that. At least it was considered to be a problem. If, if district courts continue to do that, then we're not going to have constitutional law developed. When are you going to have clearly settled law? So within what the Supreme Court did about 12 or 13 years ago, it said, well, we're going to solve that problem. We're going to force district courts as part of the qualified immunity inquiry to address the constitutional merits first. And then and only then will they be permitted to deal with qualified immunity. And almost immediately thereafter, the district courts and the circuits began to squawk about it. Say, wait a minute. Sometimes, if we address the constitutional merits, they are so fact-specific that they are, rel are barely relevant for guidance otherwise. In other situations, the, the, the merits were so very high, we don't need to get to them at all. Why should we waste judicial resources when it's clear the defendant should be protected by qualified immunity. So after 10, 12 years ago in the Saucier case and others saying, you have to address the merits first, the Supreme Court backed off and said, we prefer that you do, but we're not going to make you do it. That's Pearson versus Callahan. We prefer that you address the merits first, the district court says, but uh, the Supreme Court says to district courts and litigants, but if you think that it's not appropriate to do so, we'll let you get off the hook. We'll let you duck the merits. And in fact, what's ironic, an example, an ironic example of the Supreme Court doing just that, right? Ducking the merits 
is that Reichel versus Howard's case, Supreme Court ducked the merits of this First Amendment retaliatory arrest case. So here the Supreme Court is doing, and it regularly does this, with qualified immunity, doesn't address the merits. So that must have played a role as well. Justices must have said, you know what? You know, we are ducking these tough issues fairly often ourselves. How can we force these, these lowly district courts and courts of appeals to do what we ourselves uh, do not want to do? All right, moving uh, right along as the cliche uh, goes here. Uh, another real world point, qualified immunity as such never goes to the jury. Qualified immunity as such never goes to the jury. The judge always decides the clearly settled law question. Obviously, the jury can't do that. The judge even decides whether a reasonable defendant, whether a def the defendant uh, acted reasonably under the circumstances. What those circumstances are, that's for the jury where there are genuine issues of material fact and dispute. So the judge always instructs the jury to rule one way or the other depending upon the facts that the jury finds. So again, qualified immunity as such, and I realize that the contrary happens occasionally, qualified immunity as such never goes to the jury. That's Hunter versus Bryant in my understanding of the, of the case. Right? Now, the qualified immunity test, as I mentioned before, is objective in uh, nature. And since it's objective, it gives a greater role to the jury than it had under the old qualified immunity test from several decades ago, before Howler versus Fitzgerald. All this is in my uh, outline which had a subjective element. So let's put that to the side. That certainly uh, makes qualified immunity more defense protective. Moreover, in most cases, the Supreme Court has instructed, there should be little or no discovery until qualified immunity is addressed. And it goes beyond that. If a defendant moves for summary judgment based on qualified immunity and the district court denies it, the defendant who has lost can take an interlocutory appeal to the circuit. And that will, you know, uh, the Donges case, Stewart versus Donges, that stops the district court proceedings. It ousts the district court of jurisdiction, at least with respect to the individual liability claims. If there's a local government liability thing, it may proceed, it may not, depending on the case. Uh, the case that says you can take an interlocutory appeal is Mitchell versus Foresight. The case that says that you can take the interlocutory appeal only on issues of law, that is the existence of clearly settled law, is Johnson versus Jones, near the bottom of page uh, 12. There are a couple of other things uh, you'll want to look at. The Ortiz case at the bottom of page 12, and the Camrita case at the top of page 13. Let me give you an Ortiz case uh, from the 10th Circuit, and then we're going to move uh, on into private party immunities, and then finally into local government uh, liability. Uh, take a look at, uh, or just write down this case, this site, Copar Pumas Company, C-O-P-A-R Pumas Company, uh, at 639 Fed 3rd, 1025. 639 Fed 3rd, 1025. You will all want to look at Ortiz and this 10th Circuit case if you decide after you lose your motion for summary judgment based on qualified immunity not to take an interlocutory appeal immediately. You'll want to look at what the costs and benefits of that may be. So be prepared. Private defendants. You know that private defendants are um, 
uh, may sometimes be sued under Section 1983 for damages liability when they act under color of law. <coughs> Until last year, the general rule based on Richardson, bottom of page 13 now, take a look at the outline, <coughs> private defendants who were, who were sued under 1983 were not protected by qualified <coughs> immunity. They were not protected by qualified immunity. Richardson dealt with prison guards. And the court's reasoning there, I think it was an opinion, if I recall correctly by Justice Breyer, was that there are market forces that encourage compliance with the Constitution. And therefore, we don't need qualified immunity protection. Interesting. Fularski may have changed that. For those of you who are private attorneys who may occasionally be called upon to work for state and local governments, you'll want to know that Fularski held a private attorney retained by a city to handle investigations was entitled to qualified immunity protection. Major case. Here is the issue that I wonder about. The reasoning in Falarski was functional. It asked, what does this privately retained lawyer by the government do? Well, he does exactly what the government lawyers do. That's a functional approach. That's inconsistent with the approach in Richardson involving prison guards, prison officials. So I wonder whether Fularski is the outlier because it deals with lawyers or whether Richardson is an outlier. So any of you uh, who, are dealing, who may deal with these kinds of issues, you should know that it's kind of up for grabs with respect to others who may be engaged in contracts, uh, who may be under contract to do government uh, work, state or local government work. All right, I have 10 minutes and we'll do local government liability uh, obviously fairly quickly, but I'm going to hit on the high points. <clears throat> I'm assuming, but I'll say it anyway, I'm assuming everybody knows that local governments can be sued under Section 1983 for damages, but only for compensatory damages. They cannot be sued for punitive damages, and all this is in my outline. States, in contrast, cannot be sued under Section 1983 for damages anywhere. It's not an 11th Amendment issue. It is a person issue because the 11th Amendment doesn't apply in state court. But it's a person issue. So local governments, yes. States, no. What kinds of local government bodies? All kinds. General purpose, special purpose. What are the elements of the 1983 local government liability cause of action? Well, they include everything I've said before about constitutional violations, causation, and the like, but there are additional elements. Uh, a very important takeaway principle, no respondeat superior liability. The court for decades, and this court especially, is sensitive about responding at superior liability. It's done all kinds of things doctrinally to make the space between local government liability and responding at superior as wide as possible. So responding at superior liability doesn't work. What do you need? The plaintiff has to allege and prove an official policy or custom. In other words, the local government uh, must have an official policy or custom that when implemented by a, you know, a, uh, it's a Star Wars phenomenon, right? There's a, a force field there that I can't get past. I just saw that in Hunger Games last week, as a matter of fact. <laughs> um, the local government uh, uh, when it has an official policy or custom, which one implemented 
by a, an official or employee brings about a constitutional violation may be liable for compensatory damage. No qualified immunity for local governments, <laughs> you should know. So, what's an official policy or custom? Well, let's break this down analytically into two approaches. <laughs> and we'll do all this in five minutes. <laughs> we can do it. One situation is, uh, one scenario is when the government itself acts. A local government enacts an ordinance, promulgates a regulation. You get the idea. That's an official policy. That really is official. Sometimes a local government doesn't have an official policy, but in effect does something regularly. That's the custom. That custom, if it's unconstitutional when implemented, can bring about a, a local government liability as well. So the first scenario, the local government itself acts. The second scenario is uh, more complicated. How many of you know what policymaker liability is for local government liability? Ah, wonderful. <laughs> Believe it or not, when certain high-ranking officials violate a plaintiff's constitutional rights, that constitutional violation may be attributed to the local government itself, where that high-ranking official is what we call a policymaker. What is a policymaker? Well, I'll tell you what a policymaker is not. A policymaker is not necessarily a person who effectively exercises final decision-making authority. That's not a policymaker necessarily. A policymaker makes policy at a general level. How do we know who a policymaker is? Here is where your New Mexico law is going to be relevant. You look at the high ranking official and you ask under New Mexico state law, local government liability law, is this high ranking official a policymaker? Well, who is obviously a policymaker? A city council. <laughs> That's clear. But sometimes you can have a school superintendent who is, has been delegated responsibility, policymaking authority by a school board to make policy. You get the idea. Sometimes not. Here is what you need to know. If this gets complicated. It's almost analogous to what happened with prosecutorial immunity. You've got to focus on the specific challenge conduct and ask, with respect to that conduct, is this high-ranking official a policymaker? There are sheriffs who may be policymakers with respect to jails, but not with respect to law enforcement. And the reverse the, can be true as well. And it gets even messier. There, there, are, there may be situations in which someone who is denominated a county sheriff is actually a policymaker for law enforcement, not for the county, but for the state. And you know you can't sue a state. That's the McMillian case in my outline. Okay? So, policymakers, when can, uh, uh, if a policymaker acts unconstitutionally, and we look at the state and local government law to see if it's a policymaker, that will be attributed to the local government and make the local government liable. There is one other scenario which is really related to the two scenarios. It's the most complicated of all. It's the area in which plaintiffs have the most trouble, in which it is very messy for you to defend, but usually you'll win if you can make it through. Failure to train liability. Local governments can... Sorry I'm moving so much. No problem. Okay, this is how I get my exercise. Uh, local governments can be held liable for their failure to train uh, government officials in connection with the citizens with whom the government officials come into conduct. City of Canton is the leading case there. What's the standard uh, of culpability for failure to train liability? It is it has traditionally been considered to be deliberate indifference. If a city is found to have deficient training with respect, say, to 
the uh, use of force in dealing with mentally uh, disabled persons who, and these, this is a tough area, who may threaten the well-being of others. In these failure to train cases, you have to establish first, this is what the plaintiff's got to do, what's, the, what's adequate training? The next question is, is this training challenged here inadequate? And then if it's inadequate, did the inadequacy of the training cause the plaintiff's constitutional deprivation? Without going into details, these are all in the materials I'm going to wrap up right now. The Supreme Court, in a couple of recent cases, especially the Connick case that came out of New Orleans, New Orleans uh, prosecutor's office, Here's what this Supreme Court is uh, basically saying. In order for a local government to be liable for failure to train, the constitutional violation that has resulted must be, get this now, this is the operative language, must be the plainly obvious consequence of the deliberate indifference. It must be the plainly obvious consequence of the local government's deliberate indifference. Notice what plainly obvious consequence sounds like. To me, it sounds like proximate cause. To me, it seems to ratchet up the level of culpability without uh, making tighter uh, the causal link that is required. So, with that, inadequate discussion of local government liability, inadequate, but uh, hopefully adequate with respect to the other subjects. Uh, I thank you. As, you. as you can tell, I really enjoy being here, uh, seeing my friends, all of you now. And I'm going to hang around outside. I don't want to take away from Joel's presentation. But before I go back to my hotel and try to make my flight back to Chicago, I'll hang around for a few minutes.